as you're describing, you've hosted uh, This Week in Startups for uh, how many episodes? 11 years, almost 1,200 now. 1,200. Yeah. yeah. So you've talked to some of the great leaders in business in general. Is there a common thing that you see or- uh, Really messed I'm, up relationship with their parents. Like just find me a great trauma. entrepreneur. <laughs> I will show me the trauma. <laughs> Their dad was like, "You're not good enough." <laughs> in, the teen in the teenage years, is that is that truly? Is there something? <laughs> there is definitely something like to... hardship of at some point in their life. Yeah, kind of thing? I think so. I mean, and there's definitely something uh, with immigrant parents um, that is a, a bit of a stereotype out here. But I've heard from many investors like that's like their. Oh, did you, are you, were your parents immigrants and did they beat into you that you have to succeed and you feel the need to succeed because they suffered to get you to this country? Like yeah. there is an archetype there that I hear, I, when I started investing, I heard from a lot of people, it's like, yeah, you wanna find those immigrant founders who are coming out of Stanford because they had to fight to get there and their parents had to fight, right? So it's like two huge fights and there's so much at stake as opposed to somebody who's fifth generation and like had everything handed to them and they were legacy and got into schools for free. But I think in general, the ability to get people to join you on that journey yes. is so critical. So you have to be charismatic, and it doesn't mean like you're an extrovert. There are introverts who are super charismatic, uh, and there are soft-spoken people. They don't have to be like super vivacious or rambunctious people. Um, they could be just quiet assassins, but you need to be able to get people to come on the journey with you. You have to be that storyteller, and you have to have that passion, and then you have to transfer that enthusiasm to investors, the press, to customers, to all the stakeholders. And if you're enthusiastic about it and you're engaged, then it's easier for people to come on that journey. And that's why people really start to think about, well, what is the purpose of what I'm doing? Mm -hmm. And it sounds corny. And I, when I first heard that, I was like, it's kind of corny. But then I read this book by, I forgot his name, Rick something. Um, he wrote The Purpose Driven Church. Mm -hmm. And he had spoken at a TED or something and everybody went crazy about it. And he's like, a church should have one purpose, one single thing they do. And like his church, which was like one of these mega churches in San Diego, just wanted to do education for this specific country, and that's all they did. Mm -hmm. And they just, they benchmarked themselves. I think it's very important to have a purpose and a mission, not everything, uh, but you know, a specific purpose of some kind of joy that you want to put into the world, you want to solve some kind of big, hard problem, and then everybody knows why you're coming to work every day. And then for the founder, when you dread going to work that day, and you don't feel like solving that problem anymore, that's the that's the tell. And a lot of times I meet young founders, I'm like, why are you doing this? And they're like, well, I was looking for an idea, and this is the one I came up with because I think I'll make a lot of money. And it's like, you're gonna quit. <laughs> yeah. You're gonna get to month nine or 10 of this, and you're gonna run out of money, or like your CTO is gonna quit, then your CFO is gonna quit, and you're gonna lose your biggest customer, and you're just gonna say, this is not worth it, you know? And if, you know, using, you know, Bezos or, um, you know, Elon's examples, they, they just needed to see this, the world change for in very specific ways. And, and Steve Elon. Jobs, you know, they needed to see a change. And it doesn't matter if they made money or they were losing or winning, they just went to work every day and they had to change it. It's almost like they didn't have a choice. I mean, no yeah. choice. Elon makes it sound like it's torture, his whole journey, but he can't help um, it. <laughs> having been a witness to it, um, you know, just as friends for for that long, uh, I, I have never seen an entrepreneur suffer more than him. And, uh, you know, he's been public about that. Like, you do not want to be me. <laughs> um, he has suffered to for those companies. He has suffered to get them where they are. It has not been easy. Can you psychoanalyze Elon in that aspect? Like, is there, is it just he can't help it? He must see the change that he uh, hmm. hopes for in the world? He's just incredibly hardworking. And uh, he's very talented as well. Uh, and I don't think people understand that. He actually is a really brilliant engineer. At the end of the yeah. day, he actually knows what he's doing um, and he asked the right questions. I mean, people were kind of aghast that, that he was asking Vlad such good questions yeah. and they're like, oh my God, Elon's the best journalist on the planet. And it was like, That's what kinda, he does. anybody who knows Elon knows he has great questions. I mean, I've been, I used to have dinner in LA and my book agent also was Sam Harris's agent. And Sam and I met, um, through John Brockman and we became friends because we lived near each other and I was friends with Elon. And then I used to invite them to both dinner in Brentwood because one lived in Bel Air, one lived in Santa Monica and I lived in Brentwood. And we would go to this place, Papone, this Italian restaurant. And every Tuesday for years, we would just, the three of us, every other Tuesday or so, we'd have dinner. 
And uh, I'd sit there and Sam wanted to know about AI and Elon's talking about artificial intelligence because he's on the board of DeepMind and uh, Elon wanted to know about atheism and meditation and all this other stuff that, uh, you know, Sam was an expert on. I got to sit there and like, just listen to these two guys <laughs> yeah. talk. And, and they yeah. have both piercing intelligences, but Elon, go, he goes straight to the, to the gut like the 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 questions that no engineer wants to hear is like just the basic stuff that yeah. it's like why the hell are you doing it this way yeah when the obvious solution is like much easier or or this or that like why haven't you tried this you can figure but, things out i mean he, he's a problem solver i mean at the end, and that's another thing like the, i think the great entrepreneurs can look at a problem with very fresh eyes like almost consistently yeah. and the Bezos described that as day one thinking, mm. right? Like just pretend this is day one every day. Yeah. Um, and then other people use the term first principles. Yeah. But it basically means like, when you see a problem, pause for a second and really think through what is the best possible solution here? What are some alternative solutions and get from everybody? Like, how do we solve this problem? And what people do sometimes they get in a rut. When they just come to work and they just go through their email. Yeah. They do whatever they did the t day before. They don't think, why are we doing this? Yes. And is there a better way to do it? Now you can get so obsessive about that that you can over-engineer stuff and you can never actually ship a product. Yes. So there have to be some pragmatism and some goals and some dates associated with that. But it is a very cool thing to really think like, I wonder if we actually made the batteries ourselves, what that would look like. Yeah. Or I wonder if we could get to two-day shipping, you yes. know, or I wonder if we could do same-day shipping. Like you need to have somebody who's willing to say, you know what, fuck it. Let's set a crazy audacious goal. Okay. Uh, two-day shipping of any product anywhere in the United States. Mm -hmm. And once you throw the gauntlet down like that, now everybody knows they're, they're rowing in the right direction. Two-day shipping, Amazon Prime. And that's what people didn't realize about Amazon. The business wasn't the shipping of those products. It was getting you to sign up for Amazon Prime. Mm -hmm. the, they have you know, hundreds of millions of people doing Amazon Prime for 10 bucks a month. I think globally it's probably cheaper. But that was the driver of that business was all of those people because they would... You're an Amazon Prime subscriber? Mm -hmm, Do you course. know how much you pay? No. Exactly. <laughs> it started at $50. And I think they even had like $40, $50, $60 was like the testing in the early days. And now it's, I think, $149, 12 oh, wow. $13 a month. If you pay for the year, I think it goes down to 10 bucks a month, 120 And you're like, wow. And it's like, yeah, you're paying $13 a month for the privilege of shopping <laughs> at Amazon. Yeah. Uh, and, but you would you say it's the greatest thing yeah. in the world because anything i need you know if you forgot a microphone or a cable goes bad or a camera goes bad you get it here you know within a day or less yeah it's pretty amazing <laughs>